All right. Hello to our listeners and viewers, and welcome to the Environmental Echo of uh, PW Grocer's monthly podcast. I'm Paul Boyce, the CEO and president of PW Grocer, as well as your host. And I want to introduce our, our guest today is going to be Inez Borbiglia from Sky Testing Civil. Uh, they do a lot of interesting work, and we're going to cover all those topics very shortly. But before we get started, I do want to mention... Uh, the best way to get a hold of us, if you guys have ideas or thoughts you want to share or topics for future podcasts or you have a comment you want to make or share with us, the best way to get a hold of us is our website, which is www.pwgrocer.com backslash podcast. And let's get into today's topic with Inez. Um, so I, I do want to welcome her to our show and I'll give you guys a little bit of an intro to um, you know, her background and um, you know, what she's in, involved with. Uh, she does lead a team of engineers and inspectors who meet the environmental and engineering needs of Sky Testing's clients, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of who those folks are in a, in a minute. But for those of you who don't know Inez, the path she's followed to her current position is varied and interesting. Uh, she spent a good portion of the last 20 years working in local government out here in Suffolk County, I believe. Yes, for sure. Uh, which included stints at two different townships, which was the town of Brookhaven and the town of Islip, which is where I had the pleasure of first meeting her. In both instances, uh, she's played key roles in helping these municipalities navigate the ever-evolving environmental landscape on, uh, on Long Island, which, <laughs> is it ever-evolving? Uh, and in particular, she's managed the environmental assessment and remediation of the town of Islip's Roberto Clemente Park in Brentwood, uh, which was a town facility that suffered significant environmental issues, uh, which resulted from contaminated fill being used at the park, uh, unbeknownst to the town. Um, but outside of her work, uh, you know, this is something I just found out. We were just talking about. Very interesting. Uh, Inez is a boxing instructor, a talented musician, and a lover of live music. Inez, welcome to the Environmental Echo. Thank you, Paul. I'm happy to be here. We are happy to have you. So with that said, why don't we just get right into today's topics? Um, you know, uh, from my understanding and our conversations, you know, you guys, Sky Testing, you deliver a variety of services, uh, as we mentioned, includes inspections and, and materials testing. Can you tell us a little bit about your firm and the resources you guys use to provide uh, or you provide to your clients? Sure, sure. We're a, a third-party uh, provider for special inspections. Uh, we have a materials testing lab in Bohemia. Um, we service uh, all industries. We've done a lot of school work, higher education. Um, we're in the private sector almost equally to the public sector. And uh, we are uh, working almost always exclusively for ownership to ensure that the, the uh, fabrication and the placement of materials are following the building code and the spec and that the materials used are appropriate. We test those materials in a laboratory and, um, and it's a niche world. And it's a little, it's not quite building inspecting. It's not engineering inspecting. It's uh, in between. We deal with soil, concrete, Mortar, grout, steel, welding, bolting. So, we uh, we're in construction, but we don't build anything. And uh, you need us uh, for final sign off on on many of the projects, especially in New York City. Uh, yeah, that's the next question is you know your target markets. You know you do mention New York City. Um, what's sort of the ge geographic extent that the firm covers here? It it really is uh, all five boroughs, although Staten Island's really far. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, Always fun so, to get to, yeah. <laughs> and from, and and the same with the East End as well. Um, mm. it, really, it's all of Long Island. Uh, it's five boroughs and uh, and West Bar uh, Westchester. Um, the uh, licensing specifically for all five boroughs is is you know required for New York City, which we are licensed in as a Class One Special Inspection Agency. Oh, and, and you know you've told me, but for our listeners' benefits. Um, uh, how, how large is the firm? How many employees do you have? Today? We have um, uh, not not many. We're small. We have um, about ten full time and four part time, and uh, several consultants, a couple of engineers. Uh, we have two engineers on staff. So that was my next small. question. What's yeah. what's the makeup of the staff? You got a couple engineers. What else? Yeah, we have a structural, uh, mechanical, and civil. Um, we have a lab manager, a lab director. Uh, and then as far as the field staff goes, you have master special inspections and all different special inspectors or field technicians at various levels. Um, and then administratively, there's a, there's a handful of people. And you've also shared with me about the lab itself. You know, and this, this blows me away that we're, and we'll get to this a little bit later on, um, you know, how you came into this role, but, you know, to, to come from like 
town government to <laughs> operating a, a testing materials lab. I, I just can't, I can't figure it out. Um, I think it's great. <laughs> it, you know, it, being in the environmental world, you're, you're, you can appreciate this. You're asked all the time to test soil for chemical analysis. Absolutely. And, uh, and um, eventually those clients would ask me to test the physical characteristics of, this, of the soil. You know, what's the grain size and the gradation sieve? So I was, you know, oh, it's a little different. So I'd find some lab somewhere that could do that for us. And then eventually when they're building from construction, they asked me to do the soil compaction and the density. And that was the full crossover into special inspections. It was a whole new world for me. And I really subbed most of those services out I've worked with almost every company uh, locally in our region and, and some of the really big firms in New York City. And um, after a while, I just took great interest in and said, I could do this myself on my own. And, and I did. I went uh, to uh, some folks in the, in the know. I, I found some space locally and built a company. Wow, fantastic. What I didn't share with you, um, starting out as an intern in college, I worked for a civil engineering firm. And, uh, you know, so a million years ago, we were building the uh, service roads on the LIE. Oh, wow. And I got a summer full of doing soil testing. Um, I would collect the soil sample. I'd mm -hmm. go do the sieve analysis. Mm -hmm. I'd sit there in the lab, <laughs> put it through the shakers, weigh everything up, you know, exactly plot everything up, and, you know, all that fun stuff. I would also do the compaction tests, you know, with the sand cones. <laughs> oh, God. Exactly. I spent a good three months of my life one summer doing that. Um, and then the next summer, I was lucky. They brought me back, and they were doing concrete work. Then I got to do doing cilinders, you know. And I, I didn't get to break them, but I'd get to form the cylinders, rot them, all that fun stuff. Exactly and then what we do. the labs would come and pick them up, crack them. Uh, and there was one time I did get to go to the lab and watch them crack, which is, you know, it's as Paul Grosser, our founder, used to say, it's like watching someone ice fish. You know, and it's not exactly the most <laughs> exciting thing in the world. But I, you know, as a young engineer, I was I was totally stoked to get out there and see that. But uh, it's like one of those satisfying great. videos, you know, with the, oh, the yeah. hydraulic and the crush. And yeah, we do it all day, every day, every every single day. There's it, cylinders. It's being great broken. when one goes way beyond what you expect. It's like six, seven thousand pounds. <laughs> you know, like oh, what's gosh, going on really here? Strong stuff. Yeah, yeah. what they do to this one? You know, um, you know, for our listeners, hopefully they understand what we're talking about a little bit, but. I, I didn't realize, you know, that's how you got started with this stuff, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but based on your introduction, you know, you've had an interesting career path to, to reach this current position, as we just said. Um, I also understand you were a journalism major in college. You know, how did you get from journalism to <laughs> town government to environmental consultant? It, it, it's amazing, the stretch, but um, I was covering, uh, I was a reporter. I was covering local government. I covered... Um, uh, South Nassau County and the village of Freeport, the mayor read my byline, asked me to come on board as their public affairs director, which was really the first time I'd entered government. And in a short period of time, I, you know, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, I was a PIO, a, a public information officer okay. for the a fire department, yep. for the police department. You know, Freeport has it all. Uh, every every walk of life, and what a great place to cut your teeth, you know. And uh, and after that, um, I just was uh, covering anything, and I was, you know, I had different appointed jobs here and there, and you know, were involved uh, in the political parties and all the events. And um, somehow, I end up in land use. I was in planning departments and building departments, and that's what really got me into um, land use. And eventually, uh, I was with the town of Brookhaven. As a deputy commissioner of planning and engineering and environmental, I went over to town of Isla and, uh, and then I got, you know, the remedial work for that very large environmental crime. And after that, I started to do that kind of work almost exclusively. I worked for the town? Uh, uh, for a private uh, company. After okay. I left, sure. I was with the town. Um, mm. I did a couple of others. I, there was another similar scandal a, I say scandal, but a, a problem at West Hills um, County Park. And this one didn't get as much notoriety, but it was equally as, you know. Um, Egregious. It, it was. It really was. And uh, that was another major cleanup that we took care of and worked with the DA's office on environmental crimes. So it became really interesting work as well. And then um, I, I did uh, that uh, for about seven years. Um, and uh, like I said, I started to sub out special inspections and to the point where I said, I can do this on my own. 
And uh, while I still work with environmental, I'm actually an asbestos inspector myself. I have my mold certification and radon and all that stuff. I don't do it as much as I do the special inspections. Got to hand it to you. It takes a lot of, um, I don't want to say nerve, but courage and, and certain fortitude to start your own business. You know, It's scary. Uh, absolutely. It's scary. Yes. You don't know. It doesn't matter if it's this field. You have absolutely no idea how much a business owner is responsible uh, for things that you take for granted. You think you know until someone's saying, where's the toilet paper? <laughs> and you realize you're the toilet paper person, you know, oh. and you're everything. And it's very, it's hard. The human resources, the cash flow, um, the hiring, the firing, finding the work, performing the work. I, I mean, it's, it's difficult. And that's something I hadn't realized. So I've been, you know, humbled a bit, but that's what excites me. So as a smaller firm, um, I assume you don't have any, do you have a full-time HR person? Do you have a full-time accountant or, or are you wearing all these hats? It's, it's really been me. Um, I do have outside accountant, you know, for the filing of the taxes and, you know, major questions, but all of that invoicing, the billing, the, the setup, the insurance, it's all, all been me. Oh, and, um, I've only recently been able to hire administrative uh, person to assist me. Or there's no sales development person or business development sales force. It's me. That's you. Yeah. That's me. Marketing. That's me. Um, you know, but I'm also an inspector. Still the so. IT guy too? I am the <laughs> IT guy. Thank God. Microsoft OneDrive. Oh, you know? <laughs> yeah. We've just so. switched over. Yes, I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was an empty shell, uh, reasonable space, 1,800 square feet, it had room for a garage. I've bought the equipment. I've got the accreditations. Um, you know, we're, we're licensed. It's a lot in a, in a short period of time. And um, we're always looking for inspectors. Um, they're hard to find. There's not a lot of people who have the certifications that, you know, we need. Well, hopefully some of our listeners are, uh, you know, inspectors and they've tuned yes, into this episode. And, uh, <laughs> I know this is hiring. <laughs> <laughs> always. Fantastic. Thank you. Really good. But, but back to the, um, I think the municipal stuff is, you know, you, as we said, you spent a good deal of your time or your career working for two of Long Island's larger municipalities, Brookham and Islip, you know, which is, um, we're sitting in Islip right now. We've had both town super, well, Ed Romaine and Angie Carpenter. Um, Ed's a former town supervisor. Angie still is the current town supervisor for Islip. have been on the show. Uh, both great guests, you know, uh, interesting perspectives from both of them. Uh, but from your municipal perspective, you know, what did you learn about creating solutions to these you know, environmental problems? I, I find that the towns on, in general have been ill-equipped to handle environmental uh, crimes. I think that environmental, uh, largely in a town, is defined by conservation efforts. So this town is going to have a annual hard clam census or grow oyster beds or, you know, save a, a species – but when it comes to, um, you know, dumping uh, illegal uh, materials and burying them and hiding those things, it, it falls under more engineering, sometimes inspectors, building department. It, it's not clear cut on who looks for these things. I think that since those crimes have happened, the towns have paid a lot more attention to them. And the laws have changed in the state as well. You no longer can, you have to test what comes in and out of a, a, a property. You know, in the past, the, the things have to be documented, manifested. The trucking has to, you know, match what you're carrying. The disposal has to be, you know, documented. And those things the town's never really thought of. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that they're thinking of those things, but I, I don't think that they um, all employ someone to do just that. And, and, to, and unfortunately, they put a lot onto the, uh, the contractor or the developer themselves to sort of self-certify that they're, you know, and, and I don't blame that they don't have money and they're, they're tight and not everybody has the expertise, but it's still out there. It can happen. It's, it, it, you know, and this it was does. The, the project that we, you were mentioned w was happening under the, the light of day over a course of a year Yeah, I, in the, in the form of a, you know, rehab of a soccer field right yeah. in front of everybody's eyes. So if it can happen in broad daylight, you know, so I, I don't know. I think they're all more well aware of it, which is a good thing, but, um, do you no. see them employing, you know, tighter inspection criteria with stuff coming and going from their sites now? Or? I, th I, think, I think some of them got, you know, worried and got scared and they look at it through a, a legal point of view. Um, I, I wish that there was more um, outreach from the DEC and the towns to educate them on what they should be looking for. 
Um, the DEC was the one that came up with some, you know, new laws uh, to protect, you know, the environment. And I don't know how far that gets to the town. It's just, you know, on their respond on themselves to responsibly read it and know it. But I don't know. I, I it's been a few years since I've been removed, but I know that those particular cases were a big deal. Well, they still are. If, if anything like that happens again, it's going to be... Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Armageddon. The, it's true. And the punitive yeah. damages, you know, the, yeah. um, the that is unbelievable. The lawsuits that came from it, I can't tell you how many times I've been deposed or brought... I mean, it, it's just unreal how much that resonated, that one particular case. And how long, you know, at Roberto, Roberto Clemente Park, how long did it take to get that cleanup uh, completed oh. from start to finish? Um, I mean, that was a... It was a big deal. It was a big deal. It was a big job. It was. Um, I honestly, I, I want to say from the time it was discovered um, and there was some initial testing and sort of classified and, the, and then people were identified and there were culprits and all that to the time it was truly cleaned up. It was, it was at least over a year. And then there was another part where it had to fill back in that hole after everything was taken out. So that took some time too. And... Um, Again, this is all in a public park. And in that a park was closed for a long time. It was. And the neighbors were upset. Yeah. It was during a political year where everyone wanted to get a piece of the action in terms of public relations. It was 15 front page stories in Newsday. I mean, it was a lot of coverage. And, and, and rightly so. But um, I hope that uh, that never happens again. And I, I know that Islip and, and Brookhaven have uh, done a... a, a They've paid attention to it, and they've tightened their belt, and uh, they've, you know, certainly don't want that to, to repeat in their towns. No, nobody does. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, hopefully we keep an eye on it. It does not happen again. All right. I just want to say that is the end of part one of this two-part series. Uh, Paul Boyce here, your, your host, CEO, and president of PW Grocer, and hopefully you guys can tune in for part two, which will be coming out soon. Thank you for joining us on this episode of PWGC's Environmental Echo. Download and listen to this episode on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, or by visiting our website, www.pwgrocer.com backslash podcast. For more content like this, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode.